a disco light from AliExpress that was very generously sent by Aramis or Aramis. I'm not sure the correct pronunciation of that. I would tend to pronounce it Aramis. This is described in the manual as a, a LED flat par 7x9 watt RGB light. And each of these LED positions can be red, green, blue or a mixture of those colours. It is, well, it's using that thing that it could be 3 watt chips and that would make 9 watts, but it really isn't. Let's take a look at the instructions. Sheds, stage light equipment supplier expert user's manual. Maintenance. Please keep the light in dryness and avoid using in wet place. That's reasonable enough. Using intermittently can be extend the life. Attention to clean the flan and fan and lens, usually in order to get the ventilating effects and lighting effects better. Please do not wipe the crust using organic menstruum for avoid to damage the product. Excellent. Well, I'm definitely not going to wipe the organic menstruum off its crust. Um, oh, yeah. Anyway, let's just skip, skip the instructions here and take a look at the light itself. So this is very common of the LED power cans. I'm going to flip it over. This is where the... the Balance is going to be all over the place because this is a black case. Uh, right, tell you what, I'll just lock it at that, but it's going to be a bit flary just because black cases are, are quite hard to, to film properly. I'm going to plug it in and it's going to make lots of noise because it's got a powerful fan in it. Noting that the plug is a non UK compliant plug, no fuse in it, but that's all right, I've got a fuse elsewhere. When you power it up, it goes to the last setting. Well, B007, that is not the last setting. Oh, well, that's exciting. But you can select various options. You can choose the sound uh, to light mode. That if I tap this, it will actually be changing color. Let me just uh, do this. Tap, 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 changing through colors. Uh, or you can go and you can manually override and you can set intensities. This is, this has just changed the intensities completely itself. It's just picked a random value at power up. But anyway, you can set uh, a intensity. Say for instance, we wanted full white. So let's go. Let's go, let's short, take a shortcut down. Um, I'll cover this so you can actually see a display. Let's go to 255 on red, which is the highest intensity. And 255 on green and ooh, 255 on blue. So that should be at absolutely full whack. And it's all right. Let me take the exposure off and we can take a look at the beam quality because this is important, the color mixing. That looks very splattery of colour. I point at the wall. I'm getting, yeah, a splatter of colour. It's very colourful fringes around the edges, but that's really common when you're using this type of multicolour chip because the, the chips aren't dead centre to each of the LED positions. Um, let's power this off now. And uh, brighten that up again. Let's turn this over and get it to a, a medium brightness. This is the hard thing about a, a black thing that puts out lots of light. Uh, let's test it with a lighting desk. And this is where I would guess that Aramis had a bit of a time. So I've got a little test lighting desk here. And it took me a while to get any good results. So this is a Behringer LC2412 which will immediately get screams of hate from the musicians industry because uh, they hate bearing our stuff. I think it's a very good desk for testing. It's actually well designed. It's got a very quirky operational system, but once you get used to it, it's perfect as a, a test desk and it's also pretty good for a standalone application. It has its pros and cons. But I would say it gets my vote. I quite like it as a desk, as a test desk. Let us plug this in here and let's plug the DMX into the back of this, noting that with these cheap shitty lights from eBay, you just never know what's going to happen because um, the separation on the between the mains and the low voltage side inside is sometimes not very good. And there is a possibility, and it's been happening, that 240 volts in the case of the UK, 120 volts in the case of other countries, is going to end up going along the data lead and blow up your lighting desk. Just keep that in mind. Let's power up my desk. Well, my desk is powered up. Let's plug this in. And it's already displaying a colour. This is not necessarily a good thing. I had a few problems getting any results here. Oh dear, I think I'm also having problems getting results here. Rightio. So let's take this out of uh, the mode that it's already got. 
It's set to data address 1 for the DMX. Let's get the colours reset to 0. So let's go down. It has. It's just reset to an arbitrary colour value. This is the problem with these. Uh, sometimes they really compromise on the processor. They use the uh, low cost processor to do lots. Okay, are we going to get a result here? Yes, we are. Excellent. It's, it's doing it. So, uh, options we've got from the desk. We've got control over the red channel. Note that it's very, very steppy at the bottom. That may be down to pre-scaling in the light for, uh, to keep the circuitry to an absolute minimum. Also, if you're moving the sliders up and down, it can sometimes, it can, it can be a bit glitchy and jumpy. It's not doing it now because I think I discovered what that problem was. So let's uh, put a colour up. Let's put a sort of, let's put a uh, uh, red and blue, let's make a sort of purpley colour. And we'll introduce strobe to the mix. So it's got variable strobe on channel 2, but notice that it's ignoring the movement of the slider. It's, it's busy processing what's happening. It's only when I let go of the strobe that uh, then it st starts strobing. Uh, slider channel 3 on the DMX is a preset colour, which will go through a selection of preset colours or chase modes. Uh, slider 4 is speed adjustment of those chase modes. Uh, and then sliders 5, 6 and 7 are direct control of the channels. Now, I initially could not get direct control of the channels. The reason for that was because... I'm going to unplug that fan. The reason for that was that the channel was not putting out the full 512 channels, I don't think. I changed the setting to put out the 512 channels. Sometimes these units, because they are cheating with the way the DMX is implemented, they need all those channels to allow time for the actual processor and the light to actually do computation of what it's supposed to be displaying. Let's get rid of the lighting desk out of the way. My trusty lighting desk. I've had that for so long. It's done some major, major uh, technical tasks in the past. It's been a very good desk for me. Some people hate it. I like it. Let's get the hoppy out of the way. Oh, statistics about the power. Um, standby power of the light is about 7 watts. Red at full power is 6.5 watts. Green at full power is 7 watts. Blue at full power is 5 watts above that 7 watts. And uh, all of them at full is actually about 25 watts, which isn't the combined total because the voltage is obviously being pulled down the power supply. Let's open it and see what the quality is like inside. So this thing is called, as many of them are, a Parkan. The name Parkan comes from parabolic aluminized reflector uh, which was actually the type of lamp that was used a, a tungsten lamp which is now of course banned which is bad news because uh well there are certain jobs that uh, leds do not do yet they don't pack out the same punch and for the same intensity you're actually ending up with a light that is considerably heavier and more complicated a lot of uh still got plenty of time for power lamps in some applications. So this is a little frame that comes off. I'm going to guess then, is this, any of this going to lift out? Nope. I'm going to take these screws out and this is where all the lenses fall out because they always do. I have taken some of these apart in the past. So I'm expecting a large aluminum PCB and these lenses to be loose. So as soon as I take this off, the lenses will all individually pop out, revealing uh, six pin LEDs because they're most likely wired. How are they wired? There's the red connection, which is going up and it's going through this LED, through that one, through that one, through that one, through that one. All the LEDs are in series. And then the, the white one, which is a common, is just common to all these. That is swamping out completely. Sorry, black and white. It's just, it's what happens. Plastic spacer in the front. I wasn't expecting that. So these LEDs are effectively, they've got white 
uh, a white common positive wire and then the red green blue are switched to the negative rail and all the leds are just in series all seven of them okay let's get this out and see what's underneath a power supply and a control pcb is underneath because that's really what these contain but the par par can parabolic aluminized reflector can indicated a metal can that that was mounted in and it's just a name that's kind of stuck so i can unplug this this is good and what do we have in here uh brightness back up we have a power supply with an output for the fan and an output for the driver board which everything is on the one board we've got a separate little satellite board for the connectors but everything including the led display and buttons is in this one card the mains incoming supply it does have an earth wire in that's been cut off as is common in these things oh things worthy of note the fact it's not an earth and the fact you do get ac coupling uh, from both sides across the transformer partly because of this little blue capacitor down here but partly the layers of windings uh, which form effectively capacitance in the switch mode transformer because of their close vicinity there is current coupled across from the input to the output i measured that current at about 0.4 milliamps and with a standard meter it was measuring about 87 volts ac leakage when you add a lot of these together that could potentially put quite a, a leakage voltage on your dmx network now things i've noticed in the past i don't know why they do this They've got two connectors, but the polarity is swapped around, and I'm guessing in some lights they've only used one of the connectors. I'm guessing that might be to allow for uh, using one power supply, but with two different connector pinouts, so you can just plug it in the appropriate one. It means if you plug it in the wrong one, it blows the product up. Uh, so uh, we've got two connectors here, different polarity. If you get these connectors the wrong way around, you will nook the, the unit. Nice. Excellent. Let's take the DMX off as well. Let's get this little circuit board at the bottom out and then take a closer look at it. There is a little potentiometer over there. That appears to be the audio gain uh, control. Let's get this out. I have a sneaky feeling, given that crystal there, that given the layout of components all together, I'll tell you what, I'll get it out. We'll take a closer look at it. And then we'll analyze all the circuitry. There we go. Display. Uh, with this little film across the front, I always rip the film off the front of those. It's designed to protect it during manufacture and also part of the processing of the uh, encapsulating these in resin, but that's just... Uh, yeah, I'm going to make a mess of this. I'm maybe just not going to do that then. Okay, right, give me a moment and I'll just get a little picture of the back of the circuit board because that's where all the circuitry is. All we've got on this side is the display and the buttons. Everything else is on here, so we'll take a closer look at that. Okay, let's explore the circuit board and it's really complex purely because they've saved pennies. It uses a Nuvoton N79E814AT20 microcontroller. This is a 20-pin microcontroller, and it's a fairly generic one. It's got about 256 bytes of uh, non-volatile memory that you can use to change settings in, and I think this one's got about 8 kilobytes of program memory, which is quite a lot. It's got a 16 megahertz uh, crystal, and two... Uh, load capacitors 30 picofarad apparently for that the supply comes in this connector which is also bridged across to this connector and it then goes to this voltage regulator down here which is a 7805 voltage regulator and that converts whatever supply is coming in down to 5 volts for the microcontroller and associated circuitry it's got a resistor in series of that 62 ohms the reason for that is 620 the zero is a multiplier so that is 62 ohms the reason they've got a resistor in series with the regulator here is because this circuit board is actually powered at about 24 volts and it just takes the edge it takes the extra load because this is a the 7805 is a linear regulator it dissipates 
the difference in voltage as heat. So that actually gets quite toasty. And this resistor here just shares some of that load. And as the current goes up, more voltage will be dropped across the resistor. Uh, so the incoming supply comes on. There is a large decoupling capacitor over there. Uh, there's a smaller capacitor here for the 5 volt supply. There's a microcontroller. There is a SIM4 HC164D. That is a 8-bit shift register. And the purpose of that is that when it's driving the displays here, the microcontroller controls the digits directly, but it moves data out using just a clock and a data into this. It just saves pins. It's, they've really economized in pins as this will unfold as we go on. So say, for instance, it wants to, wants to display the number seven in the first position. It will load the data out into this that corresponds to which segments will be lit for the number seven. They go to the segments and then this enables that one digit and then uh, to display the seven and then it goes on to the next digit, which might be four, and it will move the data four out and then uh, switch that digit on. It's just it's multiplexing, but also uh, pin saving multiplexing. It just uh, it saves a lot of uh, circuitry. It also relies on the impedance of the pins, the actual the logic circuitry in here to limit the current. There's no specific uh, current limiting resistors which is slightly naughty. There is a set of buttons, one, two, three, four buttons to keep that to a minimum as well. There is a voltage divider here. Each button sets a threshold voltage, which is then going to the chip and being detected by presumably an analog to digital detector. So it detects as a voltage level, a sort of a digital level, depending on which buttons press. So theoretically mashing lots of buttons would have weird effects but uh, the process will not necessarily recognize any of the other combinations. It has the RS485 bus driver. This is the DMX receiver. Sadly, the pins that determine whether it's receiving or transmitting are actually controlled by the process, one pin the processor as well. And that means that this is a, a sort of universal board. It's designed that if the software can accommodate slave and master mode, if it doesn't detect DMX, this is if the software is working, if it doesn't detect DMX and you've got one unit set up as a master and the other units set up as slaves, then this will send out uh, information onto the network again and that then allows it to actually signal to the other lights what they should be doing. So it will be listening with its microphone um, and it will be looking for audio trigger and will then do patterns, not just on the light, this light, but also on the others that are connected in the network, the slaves. The downside of that is, the bit that I'm not too happy about there, is that if you put it on an active DMX network and this processor glitches, crashes, software problems, it can bang data out, it can start corrupting the data on that network. It can take down every other light in the network visually uh, just by corrupting the data. There's a two transistor amplifier over here with some support circuitry and capacitors and resistors associated with this microphone and then a sort of master gain adjustment depending on whether the microphone was going to be, you know, where this was op optimally going to be used. I think this is not really designed for the user to adjust. They've just set it inside to a factory standard. But, you know, you could theoretically tweak that and it would change the sensitivity of that internal microphone. The output is via these MOSFETs. I'm guessing they're MOSFETs. They're marked VS30. They test out as if they're certainly not standard unijunction transistors. Was that right? Bipolar transistors might be a better there. Um, yes, that sounds about right. I, I, I never have to normally name those transistors, the standard NPN, PNP types. But these definitely look like MOSFETs and they're driven by a 2.2k resistor. There's a 10k pull down resistor. It's got the facility for a white uh, channel as well, which has an extra transistor sort of bodged on over here by the look of it. Um, oddly, the LEDs are driven from the positive supply and then they're switched to the negative rail. The negative rail also has a capacitor from the negative rail. I'm not sure why it's doing that. I wonder if that's just to round off, just to nudge a little bit off the edge when it's pulsed with modulation LEDs to make them appear less flickery if it's not achieving a high speed. I'm not really sure. There's something very odd here. It's common in these units. There's no current limiting to these LEDs at all. 
The switchboard power supply, I measured the open circuit voltage, it might be different under load, but 22.7 volts, let's just say 24 volts, because that's what's marked all over this board. And they've obviously applied pulse width modulation pre-scaling to the LEDs because they're relying entirely on the impedance of the LEDs when they're being smashed at high current. And keep in mind that the I measured the voltage across the LEDs. The blue uh, circuit was uh, at one equivalent of one watt per LED. That's 350 milliamps through the whole circuit. The combined voltage was 24.5 volts. So they're, that, they're really close to that 24 volts. The green was about 23.8 volts. So again, close to 24 volts, not much to drop. But the red was only about 16 volts. And that means that the red has to be pulsive modulated. It's really being, the current is being smashed through the reds. But it's being pulsive modulated so that at full setting, it keeps it within its one watt rating. It's a terrible way to drive LEDs. I did scope that. It showed roughly about, it was running at 25% duty cycle, even when I set this up maximum intensity in the red. Anything else worth mentioning on this? That is this covered more or less completely. It's just apocalyptic. The software must be a complete nightmare in there. But it's impressive what they've done. Let's take a look at the power supply board. Talking of which, this little fan runs quite noisily. Did you hear how loud it was? This little fan I reckon might actually be 12 volt. I don't know if it is rated for 24 volts. Certainly at 12 volts it was drawing 100 milliamps and it was still quite noisy. I have a horrible feeling they're really pushing this little fan quite hard. The power supply. We may have to zoom down in this a little bit at the risk that we're getting so close that it's going to be an apocalypse for resolution. Here is the separation. There's a nice scratch across there. Here's the separation which has been completely ruined by the fact they've put text right in the middle of the separation area where it separates the mains voltage side, which is this side, from the low voltage side. So they've violated the uh, the separation area with that text, the reference number, but also they've done what they so often do. There's an opto-isolator here and they've just run a track right under the opto-isolator, just said, hey, who cares, let's just, let's just breach the separation distance. So the separation distance is about two and a half millimetres, which is tolerable, but it depends if the transformer actually has decent separation on the windings. I'd normally hope to see sort of the double insulator type windings. I'm not necessarily seeing that here. The power supply itself has the incoming terminal, a token gesture ferrite bead, which is not going to do much at all. It's got a fuse, a little tiny glass fuse, which will go bang on UK mains 240. It's got a bridge rectifier and then a fairly fat capacitor. What is that rated? 400 volt, 22 microfarad. Then it's got a little uh, switch mode chip. The switch mode chip is uh, on bright electronics. A lithium semiconductor company. Uh, it's really the circuitry is just, I'll just zoom out a bit here and maybe just scale that down intensity. The circuitry is basically just as shown here. It says EMI, EMI filter. That's the little token gesture box ticker there, which is not an EMF, EMI filter. Everything else is pretty much as it should be. It's got the bootstrap diode um, going up to the bootstrap capacitor. It does appear to have the proper filtering components in place. I didn't really check that through, but it looks like they're there with the capacitor. It does look like it's got the filtering, the capacitor with the resistor, and the diode feeding into that from the winding. Yes, it does have the filtering to protect the uh, MOSFET. On the output, it's got the diode and the smoothing capacitor, that's the, the diode there, and uh, ultimately it's this big smooth capacitor here. There is a resistor to pose a slight load on it, um, and that resistor has been mounted because it will get quite hot right next to the capacitor, which is not good. There's the Class Y capacitor with a blob of solder on top. There were lots of blobs of solder all over the circuit board, which doesn't inspire confidence. It's got the uh, 431 voltage uh, threshold uh, programmable voltage threshold uh, chip, which then 
drives this up to isolator, just as is shown here. And the voltage is set with a couple of resistors, so you could adapt this, you could make this a 12 volt power supply if you want by changing those resistors, but it is optimized for the 24 volts. And uh, that then uh, signals back to uh, drive more current through, switch the uh, transformer, pulse it to couple current across when the voltage is getting low in this side and it'll pulse this. The chip itself has a MOSFET that it drives, which is on a heat sink. So it's a fairly decent chunky power supply. But the question is, it's supposed to take about 3000 volts in the UK. That is the flash test, 3000 volts for about a minute. I'm not really sure if this will manage that, but I suppose there's one way to find out. I do have a high voltage tester. I could bridge all the transformer inputs and all the transformer outputs, and I could test this at high voltage. That would be interesting to do. Let's do that. I'll be back in a moment. Rightio, that's the high voltage test set up. I have bridged the secondary with the wire and it's connected to the high voltage side. I've bridged the primary with another wire and it's connected to the ground reference. Unit. I could have done it the other way around, but I didn't. This is how I did it. Let's turn this on. So we're looking for about, I'll just tuck these wires out of the way so I don't become a cropper here. Uh, we're looking for a test voltage of about, so that's 1,000 volts, 3,000 volts what we're aiming for, 2,000 volts. The leakage current is AC leakage across the windings, the capacitive coupling. 3,000 volts, and it should sit there for a while, and it should handle that for a minute. You can hear it fizzing. It wouldn't surprise me if it sparked across between the tiny gap uh, at the opto isolator, but so far it's holding out. It is holding out. And technically speaking, at this point, I'd say that it's actually passed. Where is the noise coming from? I can see a, hear a corona discharge type noise, but that's more or less it. Um, is that about a minute? I would say that's passed. I'm not going to willfully destroy it. Do I take it up to 4,000 volts? Oh, it tripped. It tripped out. Where did it spark across there? Let's wind that up again. It's burning inside, probably. Is it actually? I don't see where it's actually jumped across the thing, but the power supply itself is now what I'd classify as not really compliant. It did survive the 3000 volt test. I would say from the noise that it's not too happy. No, it's pulling the voltage way down now. It has arced over. I would guess that's the winding, windings of the transformer. One moment, I'm just going to check that. I've removed the transformer from the circuit board. I've connected it to a 500 volt test. I could go up to 1000 volts. 500 volts is enough. It fails the test. You can hear it fizzing inside. To narrow it down initially, I actually used the uh, thermal imaging camera while I left it on the high voltage tester to arc. So this has broken down. I have to say that when you get a transformer like this, all it takes is that tiniest little spark across. As soon as the insulation is broken down, that's it, screwed, because uh, it will continue to arc across at that point. This is a very ferocious image. I shall tame it down just a little tad. Let's open this transformer. I'm not sure how easy it's going to be. It might be that the actual arcing is tiny inside. It may not actually be significant to the point that you could actually see any damage. But there's one way to find out, and that's to open it. If I don't find anything too obvious too soon, I will curtail this bit. But I'll open it up anyway and take a look inside. It's always interesting to see what went wrong. I have to say that it did pass the test. I did push it too far. Uh, it did pass its 3000 volts, which is considered a sort of an extreme fault voltage. Although having said that, you consider these 
USB power supplies, even good quality USB power supplies, and people are plugging the little ionizers into them, which generate a high voltage re with reference to ground as they charge the air. And those will potentially be uh, flashy over, sparky over inside those. And someone did send me a video of a power supply that was sparking inside, just a routine that was going snap, snap across the circuit board. This core might not come out too easily because it will potentially be... It snapped. Okay, that's fine. Let's see if I can not remove another chunk from my finger like I did before. I did that with a screwdriver. Skill. Okay, this ain't going to come out easy, is it? I think I may have to use brute force. Hold on. No, even that's not working. Let's see which side we can get out first. Where's my long nose pliers? Are they going to... Actually, I don't think they're going to work either. I think it's just going to be crunchy, crunchy. Oh, I, I do see traces of blood. I've obviously impaled myself at some point already. Excellent. It's not really a surprise. I do it quite a lot. Fortunately, I have engineer-grade auto repair. Oh, there's the, there's where the blood's coming out. Excellent. This is one of the advantages of uh, working for your life. You end up uh, with a, bo a body that has the ability to repair quite quickly. Letting you do foolish and dangerous things without worrying about it too much. I'm not getting on too well here. I'm not going to just ignore that. I'm going to start taking the tape off here. I don't think we're going to see what's up. But, you know, there's no harm in doing it. I don't think there's going to be anything super obvious. But I could be wrong. It depends where it is inside that it's been arcing. So that was bet between the primary and the secondary. It was the primary winding as opposed to the feedback winding. I shall move that big transformer, big transformer, big screwdriver out of the way. So let's uh, get this tape off first. What I could also do here is uh, I could energize it and listen, listen for where the thing is sparking. It only takes a pinhole though to actually let that current through. So this outer winding is the sense winding. So let's unwind that. It is wound quite tightly to the point that it actually gone into the adjacent windings. The next layer I should hope might be, unless it's a, it might have part of the primary wound um, next and then the secondary in the middle. That's what I don't like about these small transformers. They do tend to be quite intimate with their windings. And, you know, I'd rather there was more than just a, a layer of... Well, you look at this. This is copper wire. It's got a thin layer of lacquer, a virtually invisible layer of lacquer on it. That's the only thing between you and the mains and many of the chinese power supplies and sometimes some of the... Uh, ones that are supposed to be compliant with uh, local regulations. In the old transformers, in the old days, uh, the transformers used to have a physical separate windings with a big plastic bobbin in between. All right, what have we got here? What have we got here? This looks like the... This looks like... Um, a primary winding. So I shall cut into this. This could be like watching paint dry. My apologies if it is. Um, you can always skip forward to see the what happens at the end. This would also be an excellent opportunity to subscribe if you're not subscribed already. Just if you like the videos and only if you like the videos. And if you think the video is shite, remember to give it a thumbs down. Or if you like it, give it a thumbs up and all that stuff. See, I don't normally say stuff like that. I normally let you guys make your own decisions about such things. Now, what's coming to mind here is there is... Oh, you know what? These are just wound right over. I wonder if that's where it was arcing across. 
Uh, there's one way to find out if I've not already removed the faulty bit, and that is to strip this wire here and see if I can actually spot where it's arcing across. Although, having said that, the tester just cuts out as soon as it detects a short a fault in the wiring, it will just automatically cut the voltage off. So, let's see this. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of thinking, I don't like that. That is very close to the... It's the same old story. They, they don't keep them separate in the sense that where the windings come out, the secondary windings, the supposedly low voltage ones, the other ones end up at some point wound up against them. They're supposed to kind of keep them separate. This is where the double insulation of the wire, you get the double or triple insulated wires that actually have super thick insulation, but that's where that's coming out there. I wonder if that's where it's actually failed. I don't think I'm going to be able to see with the... What I could do, I could see if the fault has cleared. Um, by powering up that way. I'll do that. It's not, not going to take very long, is it? If the fault has cleared, then it's most likely that I've already pulled off the faulty bit. Although I may also have disturbed it and uh, hidden the fault. Tester on. Test. Oh, now it's passing the test. So um, I may have cleared the fault there. It may well have been. Oh, I wish I'd tested it earlier now. Damn. Not to worry. I think it may be where the first section of the primary was actually wound over the top of the connections coming out to the secondary, and that's where it's uh, broken. The insulation is broken down. I just don't trust these things. You see, they have made an effort, uh, by the look of it, to keep the... If we can get this tape off. To keep the secondary winding... You can't really see an awful lot here. I'll try and nudge up just a wee tad. They've tried to keep the secondary wind by the look of it in the middle of the course, so to speak. Oh, no, they've not. They've just run it right up to the ends. Willy-nilly, I'm talking crap. They've not made any effort whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, it just... You think, even if it passes, it's, t it's a 3,000 volt test. What about time? Because these things can run quite hot, these little transformers, and vibration and time could actually, you know, break down the insulation in these. I just don't like modern supplies versus the old traditional ones. The old ones actually made a huge effort to keep the 240 volt side in the, in the UK away from the low voltage, the 5, 12 or 24 volt side. Yeah, there's just no way to avoid that. That's filled up. The secondary is so filled up here. The uh, the wires are crossing right over where it comes out to the uh, to the terminals. So I'd say that's it. But, um, to be fair, it did pass its three thousand volt test, so that you know at least says something. But it's not a transformer that I trust. If you open up a cheapy uh, USB power supply from say Poundland or something like that, you'll see that the secondary has at the very least some sleeving uh, to support to cover those wires where they come out but more likely the winding will actually have super thick insulation on it like multiple layers of insulation so it's got that extra barrier between that and the primary uh, in this case it's just not got that and that's why I'm always wary about these disco lights that you know that the main side coupling across to the low voltage side comes onto the circuit board and goes through this little driver chip onto the network and that could literally just destroy lots of lights on your network. It could uh, cause a lot of damage. If you're using a cheap light like this, a 10 or 20 quid uh, LED light and you've got a lighting that gets covered in hired in lights, you could actually end up with quite a huge bill. A friend recently sent me a picture which uh, showed a circuit board that it's very clear that the DMX had been subjected to mains voltage and the damage was quite considerable on it. But there we go. Uh, the unit is just absolutely optimised to the hilt. It's, it's cut down. Another odd thing here, four pin connector, five pin plug, um, that you literally just have to jam it on wherever you can get it on. It just splays that out. It's very odd. 
and grossly overdriven red LEDs that are just compensated for by scale and the pulse of the modulation. It is. It's cheap. It's disposable. And it's not totally 100% safe. But there you go. That's what you get for these cheap products.